Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Nakashimas uh, speaking, and uh, I will be happy to share this uh, morning seminar at ISNA. So today we have a very special guest from uh, USA, Houston, Texas, uh, Rice University. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much for joining us. And uh, uh, for his seminar, I will a little bit about uh, introduce uh, about him. And he, he got a PhD degree in University of Chicago, and after that, uh, he got a uh, uh, postdoc somewhere. I don't know. What, what's it? Some university, sorry. So after that, after a postdoc work, he, he, he moved to uh, Rice University. And since 1993, he is a, a professor uh, there. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe uh, you know him well because he is a, a very out, outstanding, well-known uh, chemist or photophysicist in Kaunan uh, uh photoluminescence and photophysics. So, uh, so. Uh, he published many papers, but uh, I just show you two papers. Uh, that is a, a science paper published uh, that was published in 2002, and uh, uh, both science papers citation totally is over 5,000. That's an amazing number. Not 500, 5,000. So. Uh, yeah, one of the title of a science paper is a uh, uh, band gap fluorescence from individual single or carbon nanotube. So in, in this paper, he, he revealed, discovered that uh, carbon nanotube emit uh, showed a photoluminescence from individual carbon nanotube. That's the uh, uh, start of uh, Photophysics of carbon nanotube science. So uh, he's a really pioneer of photophysics of carbon nanotube. Uh, okay, uh, today, uh, so first of all, welcome, uh, Thank you. Professor, to ISNA. Uh, we are very, very happy to have you here in uh, Fukuoka and uh, Kyushu University and uh, ISNA seminar. So the title of this talk today is the remarkable optical properties of single wall carbon nanotube. So, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm very pleased to be here and talk with so many interesting people and see all the things you're doing. Can we have the lights now? So uh, I do want to uh, tell you, I know this is a mixed audience with different uh, disciplinary backgrounds, you're not all physical chemists or anything like that. So I'm going to present the optical properties of carbon nanotubes in a way that I hope everyone can uh, appreciate. And I'm going to start at the beginning with carbon. Carbon is the 12th most abundant element on Earth. Each of us is a carbon-based life, life form, I'm quite confident. And uh, for a very, very long time, diamond was thought to exist in two elemental forms, two allotropes. One of them is, of course, the common form of graphite that we find in pencil leads and, and all over the place. And the other one is a much rarer form of diamond. But these were the two natural forms. They're chemically distinguished by the fact that diamond is entirely sp3 bonding covalently from atom to atom, whereas graphite is an array of sp2 bonded uh, sheets. But all this changed um, uh, with the discovery of nanocarbon allotropes beginning in 1985, actually beginning at my home university, Rush University, where uh, Rick Smalley and Robert Curl and Harry Croto led an effort that led to the discovery that was the discovery of the fullerenes of C60 and related compounds. As you can see, this has turned into a very large branch of science, chemistry in particular. And then uh, in 1991, the carbon nanotubes came on the scene. In fact, that's why there's a celebration just about to start at uh, in Tokyo for called CNT25, celebrating the 25th anniversary of carbon nanotube science. 
and this is an even bigger field with just an enormous number of papers. And, uh, and then later still, the idea of separating graphite into its individual, <coughs> individual layers of graphene uh, uh, came about, was reported, and created great excitement in the physics community and material science community. So these are all called uh, nanocarbons because every one of them has a dimension, a characteristic dimension, less than 100 nanometers. And that gives them properties that are different from the uh, properties of these bulk uh, carb carbon forms of graphite and diamond. Could we turn down the gain, the volume on this a little bit? It's just starting to uh, feedback. Thank you. I also wanted to apologize in advance a little bit. I'm uh, not only jet lag because I got in yesterday, but I also have a little bit of a cold. So please excuse uh, strange noises that come out of my mouth. So nanotubes is the focus for today. <clears throat> Here is that uh, the initial nanocarbon species C60. And it is a real molecular material consisting of 60 carbon atoms, each one uh, with sp2 hybridization. The diameter of this is about 0 0.7 nanometers. And it has this family of relatives called the single walled carbon nanotubes. Rick Smalley, who basically discovered this and was one of the pioneers in this, uh, used to call these Bucky tubes. He called this Buckminster fullerene. And these were relatives. He called them Bucky tubes because each one of the carbon atoms here also has sp2 hybridization. And that means, if you remember your chemistry, that every carbon atom has one p electron that is not part of the covalent uh, bonding framework here. So these p electrons get together and create a pi electron system that has unusual electronic and optical properties. So everything I will be telling you about later has to do with the pi electron system of this extended structure called the single wall carbon nanotube. These have similarities between them. The diameters are sort of in the same range. This is about one nanometer. This is about 0 0.7 nanometers. We again have sp2 hybridization everywhere. But the big difference is that this is a, a spherical molecule, and this one's extremely extended. It goes on to a length that can be 100 or 1,000 or a million times greater than its diameter. And people have made single wall carbon nanotubes that are macroscopic, that are half a meter long really remarkable. Now, we don't work with the ones that size. Those are ridiculously difficult to work with. But ours are maybe 100 to 1,000 nanometers long. <laughs> Still, with aspect ratios of 100 to 1,000. So they have a lot of one dimensionality in their character. And that has consequences for the electronic properties. Uh, the other big difference here is that there is only one C60 molecule. And if you have a beaker of C60, in solution, every single molecule in there is exactly like every other one if it's pure. In other words, that's a chemical substance. On the other hand, single wall carbon nanotubes are a family of related structures. And there are different ways that you can make these tubes. And they all look kind of similar. But I'll, let me get into more detail about that. This is an illustration of how you can consider rolling up a sheet of graphene to make a carbon nanotube. And this is not at all how it actually happens in the laboratory. But conceptually, we can consider each carbon nanotube to have a structure that arises from rolling up a graphene sheet. And when you do that in different ways, you can wind up with different diameters of nanotubes and also different angles, roll up angles, which are uh, you can follow by the pattern of the carbon atoms on the circumference. <coughs> or by the angle that the rows of hexagons make with respect to the two axes. These are the two structural limits. So we, it seems at first that there are going to be an infinite number of these structures, all these different diameters, all these different roll-up angles. And it seems like if you really want to understand things in detail, you probably should find another system to work on, because this is going to be hopeless. But it's not quite that bad. So um, in the first place, they do exist not just as cartoons, but in reality. And here's an actually quite an old STM image from Harvard University showing this really perfect uh, structural pattern that I uh, was showing you as, a, as an illustration before. But they really do exist with atomic level <coughs> perfection. And uh, why has this topic of single walled carbon nanotubes, SWCMTs, generated so much interest in the engineering and basic science communities? Um, 
that, that interest arises from the unusual collection of physical properties. As I said, they have diameters approximately one nanometer and lengths that are typically 100 to 1,000 for many, uh, many samples. Yes? The density is low because carbon is not a heavy element, not that many protons in the nucleus. So the density is going to be low. The tensile strength, on the other hand, is very high because if you wanted to pull a carbon nanotube to break it, you have to sever carbon-carbon covalent bonds. Those are pretty strong bonds, and you have to break quite a number of them around the circumference to separate this into two pieces. The result is that the tensile strength is much higher than steel. <coughs> Excuse me. Persistence length is a measure of the bending uh, rigidity, and it's very rigid, uh, both because of the strong covalent bonding and also because when you roll up a sheet and to make a tube, like if you take a piece of paper and you roll it to make a tube, that tube is a lot stronger in terms of bending rigidity than the paper that it was formed from. Surface area is high because the carbon atoms can't hide. Every carbon atom is on the surface. Electrically, it turns out uh, that every structure is either metallic or semiconducting uh, in a very systematic way that arises from the strange combination of the electronic properties of the parent graphene sheet combined with the extra consequences of rolling it up to make a tube. There's a boundary condition on the electronic wave function that comes from rolling it up. You superimpose that on the electronic properties that you begin with, you get this very strange combination of properties that makes these things metallic or semiconducting. The optical spectroscopy, of course, follows from the electronic states that are available. And we find that all the optical spectra that I will be concerned with are pi pi star bands in the language of chemistry. So if you know about benzene, pi electron systems, and the promotion of electrons from a pi to a pi star orbital that gives you electronic absorptions in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, the electronic absorptions I'm talking about here are exactly analogous to that, but in a somewhat larger system so that they occur at a longer wavelength. In the language of condensed matter physics, these are direct band gap semiconductors. And carbon nanotubes are really kind of the essential interdisciplinary material because if you look at them in cross-section, they look like a chemical compound. There are a small number of carbon atoms with covalent bonds and the dimensions are familiar to chemists. It's a chemical problem. If you look at them along the axis, <coughs> in the first place they're much longer, in the second place I didn't mention this before, they have long range crystalline order. The pattern of carbon atoms at one place determines the pattern of carbon atom locations all the way to the end of the nanotube. So these things are like crystals, condensed matter physics material. So you have to really use a combination of the concepts from condensed matter physics and chemistry if you want to understand fully carbon nanotubes. And sometimes the, the same concept has different terms in the two different fields, you know, different language. So apart from the very interesting basic science that these offers from their novel structures, there are also a lot of potential uses that come to mind. And this has generated a great deal of research interest in the applications and engineering community. <clears throat> One area is super strong fibers, because if you can take this tensile strength and convert it into a macroscopic assembly, a macroscopic fiber, that would be terrific. A lightweight, super strong fiber. Novel electron. By the way, in this context, there was, there's this idea that has been around <coughs> for a long time about an elevator to space, that is, uh, have, have this super strong cable anchored in, in orbit, and in order to get, into, to get into space, you just climb up this cable. It's not so crazy. The, only, the main problem is materials are not strong. You need a very high ratio of strength to weight, and the only material that conceivably could do this is made out of carbon nanotubes. Novel electronics, uh, transistors made either out of single carbon nanotubes or assemblies of carbon nanotubes, uh, very intensively investigated. You can make conducting films. <coughs> Every cell phone screen that you've got in your pocket has a touch screen with a conducting transparent layer in it. And carbon nanotubes are candidates for replacing indium and oxide in that application. Sensors are another big area because every uh, 
atomist on the surface, so the properties of the nanotube are sensitive to its environment, and therefore they have potential sensor functions. In the biomedical world, uh, nanotubes are of interest both as diagnostic and as therapeutic agents. And then there's some that are related more to the mission of Eisner. Uh, they are interested, they play potential roles as in fuel cell membranes, as supercapacitor materials, and as components in organic photovoltaics. And in addition, uh, another way that you can imagine uh, a more energy, uh, new, a carbon neutral future is by having things like cars that are lighter and more fuel efficient. And one way you could do that is by making composite materials that have the strength of current materials like steel, but with lower weight, and therefore better fuel efficiency. Well, high performance composites composed of uh, polymers that are strengthened by the addition of small amounts of carbon nanotubes have a lot of potential for this sort of uh, application as well, high performance materials. And uh, getting electricity from a source where it may be available, for example, hydroelectric generators to a population center requires long distance transmission lines. And these are currently made out of copper, which is not so light and uh, has, has some uh, disadvantages from a practical standpoint because of that. And before he died, Rick Smalley was very keen on the idea of making these long distance transmission lines out of carbon nanotube wires as a way to uh, improve our energy future. So let's get back to the potential problem that there are so many of these structures that we will never make any sense out of them. We can, it turns out, you can, you can figure out, uh, first we have to enumerate all these structures and give them names. We can do that by starting with a graphene sheet and labeling each cell. Well, this is a two-dimensional object, so each cell will have a two-number address. The first number, first integer is the number of steps I'm taking along the horizontal axis, and the second number counts the number of steps along this axis. Therefore, every cell has a unique two-dimensional address. To make a carbon nanotube, we need to roll up this sheet to make a seamless cylindrical tube. And we do, to do that, we can take the origin cell here, zero, and imagine that after we have rolled it up to make a uh, nanotube, it becomes superimposed exactly on some other cell in this, in this picture. When we make that nanotube, we're going to call it uh, the 9-4 nanotube. That is, the end of this vector. This is the circumference of the nanotube we make. And we will call that nanotube by the target cell indices, 9-4. We call these NM indices. So the diameter of this tube is simply the length of this red vector divided by pi, right, this geometry. And the second structural parameter is the angle that this roll-up vector makes with this horizontal axis. This ranges from zero at the so-called zigzag structures all the way down to 30 degrees for the armchair structures. And the ones beyond this are electronically equivalent to the ones in this quadrant here. These are basically enantiomers or mirror images. So these are the only tubes that we have to worry about. So now, instead of an infinite number of tubes, there are at least a finite number. And each one has its own name. Notice that some of these are labeled in black, and some of them are red. Well, this gets back to that strange combination of electronic properties that I mentioned before. The black ones are semiconducting, and the red ones are metallic. Uh, I don't have time to describe how this comes about, but as qualitatively, it's the, it's the properties of graphene combined with the roll-up properties, uh, the uh, extra boundary condition from, on the electron's motion around the circumference when we roll up the tube. So what that means is that you can go from a 9.4 to an 8.5 nanotube. They have almost the same diameter and almost the same chiral angle, but one's a semiconductor and the other's a metal. This is amazing. And in addition, among the semiconductors, as you get to shorter, smaller diameter nanotubes with smaller roll-up vectors, the uh, band gap gets smaller. So here we have a family of materials ranging from metals to semi-metals to small band gap semiconductors to medium band gap semiconductors, all just made out of carbon atoms and tubular structures. So you can imagine how interesting this, this family of materials is to the electronics and materials people. Right. So when you do that 9-4 roll-up, you get a nanotube that looks like this. 
Here's just a cartoon of one of these things that are very pretty to look at. This is, happens to be a 7.5 man tube looking down the axis and along the axis here. So uh, it would be nice if you could go into the laboratory and make yourself a batch of 7.5 nanotubes and work on them, but we don't have that luxury. They are currently made almost always as complex mixtures at high temperature, relatively poorly controlled processes. So they're very hard to make individually. <coughs> and when you do that, you get these samples of single wall nanotubes that are kind of complicated because they have many different diameters and they have many roll-up angles and uh, they have many lengths, which doesn't affect the electronic structure, fortunately. And they have uh, different aggregation states. They like to bundle up to make parallel assemblies of, of, of tubes held by Van der Waals forces. And they're also impurities because they're made from metal catalysts, usually have some residual catalysts. You have giant fullerenes, you have amorphous carbon, you may have some double wall tubes or multi-wall tubes. So even though they're very beautiful to look at as you know, cartoons, uh, the actual samples in the laboratory are a lot more complicated and present problems. One of the problems is this aggregation. If we look down on aggregated tubes, these are seven tubes in a little bundle. And they're also very uh, hydrophobic. They hate to be in water. So if you wanted to suspend them in water, you need detergent. And if we have a bunch of detergent or surfactant molecules surrounding uh, carbon nanotubes, you can suspend them in water. So this is a whole lot of the surfactant molecules making a cylindrical micelle around the bundle and letting it be suspended in water. When we began this, this work in 2001 in a collaboration with the late Rick Smalley, this, these were the only kinds of samples people had. And when we looked at their spectroscopy, it was a mess. Uh, the interactions, the electronic interactions of the tubes within the bundle are strong enough to smear out and obscure much of the interesting photophysics and spectroscopy that they really have as individuals. So the, the, the key enabling sample processing that uh, started this whole process, project was to get the nanotubes isolated as individuals instead of as bundles. And ultrasonication provides enough energy to separate some of the nanotubes from the bundle. And then in a solution of surfactant, they acquire their own protective shell and they stay that way. So now you have not, not just bundles, but a mixture of singles and bundles. And if you uh, take advantage of the higher density here and centrifuge it, you can make the bundles go down to the bottom of the, cent of the centrifuge tube, and you can greatly enrich your supernatant in the individuals. And that was a key development for us to get samples that finally showed the electronic and spectroscopic properties of the isolated nanotubes. When, now, what are these properties? Most of the nanotube structures are semiconducting. And uh, simple theory tells you that they have a, an electronic structure that looks like this. This is density of states on the x-axis as a function of, uh, with energy on the y. So a normal three-dimensional semiconductor would just have a, a band of uh, valence states and a, and a conduction band above it with a gap, but they wouldn't have all these spikes. These spikes are a signature of the one-dimensional motion of the electrons. I like to think, as a chemist, you know, I think back to what would this look like for a molecule? Well, a molecule doesn't have bands, it has molecular orbitals. The electronic states are discrete. And, uh, of course, in a solid you have a band. And what, uh, molecules are really zero-dimensional. Solids are three-dimensional. This is basically one-dimensional. So this is a three-dimensional material trying to turn into a zero-dimensional material. And it's starting to grow molecular orbitals. That's the way you might think about this. So these spikes, which are technically known as Van Hove singularities, are uh, turn out to dominate the electronic spectroscopy. And the strong electronic transitions of a single type of carbon nanotube are the band gap transition, and then a higher one that we call the 2-2, and then still a higher one, 3-3, three, three, et cetera. For a typical sized nanotube, E11 corresponds to a photon energy in the near infrared. And E22 is a visible transition, E33 is a near ultraviolet transition. But remember that these band gaps, the electronic structure, depends upon the structure of the nanotube. So if we go to smaller diameter nanotubes, this whole energy level structure spreads out. And if we go to larger diameter nanotubes, 
the whole thing contracts. So all of these electronic transitions depend on the structure of the nanotube. And if we have a mixture of nanotubes in our sample, we have a mixture of electronic transitions, basically three for each nanotube. So this is starting to sound pretty complicated. And it is complicated. Especially if you have bundles, all these transitions blend into each other and you can't sort anything out. But the advance that we had in 2001 about isolating them as individuals inside the solution allowed us to sharpen the spectrum and see uh, not only the absorptions, but the emission across the band gap. So this is, I think, probably the first, this arguably the first spectrum that we, were, that we uh, observed. And you notice the near infrared, 900 to 1500 nanometers. And these sharp peaks are characteristic emission features of different carbon nanotube structures. So this was actually the discovery. Uh, this is one of the two papers that Professor Shima referred to it during the introduction that we published in 2002 that uh, really opened up this field of uh, and to spectroscopy to basic and also applied investigators. And this is a little, uh, this is the first picture I ever took of the nanotube emission in the near-infrared going as the excitation light went through a cuvette with nanotube suspension. Uh, if you superimpose that emission spectrum with the absorption spectrum, you can see that each one of the peaks in absorption has a counterpart very nearby in emission. And therefore, it was very clear to us that the, this was the right thing, that, that the emission we were looking at was from the same things that we were observing. So this was very exciting. And uh, the next step in this process was to try to figure out uh, in more detail which electronic absorptions, the 2 2 transitions, went with which one ones, with which emissions. So we did something, it's a very common technique in, in chemistry, it's called fluorescence uh, spectrofluorimetry. And we just varied the wavelength of the excitation light in a mixed sample, and we observed the emission of <coughs> me, the emission of the uh, sample uh, as a function of wavelength. So we watched the light come out at different E11 or infrared wavelengths as a function of uh, of this wavelength and this wavelength. And when we did that, we got this remarkable uh, landscape where we we're plotting now intensity of emission as a function of the excitation wavelength and the emission wavelength. So this, this landscape was a revelation, because this, this sample is just gray, looks like dirty dishwater. And it has this exquisitely complex uh, spectrofluorimetry that we see here. Clearly, each one of these peaks is a different structure of semiconducting carbon nanotubes. It has its own characteristic excitation wavelength and emission wavelength. And now the task ahead of us was to figure out which was which. That is, we know that there are discrete, well-defined structures for carbon nanotubes. 7.5. Okay, which one of these peaks is 7.5? And what are all the rest of the peaks? So that was called the spectral assignment problem. And this was an amazing uh, challenge and also opportunity for us. Uh, it, was, it was a very uh, interesting and uh, difficult problem to solve. Uh, but here, if we look at that landscape from the top, we see all these different peaks. And to figure this out, one of the first things we did, or one of the key things we did, was to look for patterns. So here's that same set of data. And now what we're going to do is look for patterns in the positions, not the intensities. So if we abstract this into the positions, into the positions, it turns into this. And we stared at this for a long time. We knew this had to be important. And uh, after we stared for a while, we started to see patterns. Of course, if you look up at the night sky, you can see patterns too. You see, you see animals and people and all sorts of things in the constellations, right? So it's easy to imagine patterns even when they're not there. Our brains are designed to find patterns. But there really are patterns here. Can you see some of them? There's a pattern like this. Anybody see any other patterns? One like that. Another one like this. And we weren't imagining them. Those patterns are all really there. So now the question is, where did this pattern come from? This is just a, an assortment of carbon nanotubes. Why does the spectroscopy have this exquisite pattern to it? And the answer is <clears throat> that this is a direct reflection. The systematic pattern is a direct reflection of the pattern of structures that you make as you systematically roll up the carbon, uh, the graphene sheet, to make various diameters and roll up angles of carbon nanotubes. So this, this is just 
the consequence of the connection between molecular structure and molecular spectrum in its most, uh, most beautiful illustration, I think. So having this pattern uh, let us make use of some model calculations, which weren't nearly good enough to tell us which peak was which, but told us that if we could figure out what any of them was, then we knew along these lines how N and M were changing. So it let us uh, see the network pattern, even though it didn't identify individuals. But we were able to finally anchor that pattern, and then we finally came up with this uh, connection between the spectroscopy here and the structures here. So let me illustrate that connection between structure and spectroscopy. Here are the spectral patterns. Some of these spectral peaks are now assigned to what we call the near armchair species, ranging from 5.4 to 10.9, closest to the armchair structure. And then there's another family of nanotubes called the two family, where n minus n equals 2, that line up right next to those and fill in these tubes here. And what about three? Why did I jump to four? If n minus m is evenly divisible by three, we have a metallic nanotube. Metallic nanotubes have no band gap, they have no photoluminescence or fluorescence, and they don't appear in a picture like that. These are the blank frames. Now, so we've just finished on the fives, and now we're, we're seeing the sevens. <clears throat> And why are some of these red and some of them are blue? Well, if you take n minus m divided by 3, the remainder is either a 0, 1, or 2. The zeros are metals. The 1s or 2 are semiconductors, but it's two different subclasses of semiconductors. So those are tagged as blue and red, respectively. And you see that they segregate here uh, in this picture. It's kind of like the US election results. But they're, uh, they're mixed, mixed over here. So at the end of this, we knew with spectroscopic precision the first and second transition wavelengths for 33 different nanotube structures. And this was really a revelation. The theoreticians had precise uh, ener transition energy data to guide their calculations and to anchor them. And this also created an enormously powerful way to identify nanotube structures just by their spectroscopy. So the outcome of that was that we took this pattern and we extrapolated it to other nanotube structures, and then we got this picture which is sort of like a Rosetta Stone because it translates between the realm of spectroscopy and the realm of structures here. And now for every nanotube structure labeled here, we know exactly what the combination of 2-2 and 1-1 transitions are going to be. So this immediately has analytical uses, right? It's hard, and all these things look pretty much the same, right? If you had to distinguish an 8-6 from an 8-7 nanotube under the transmission electron microscope, you would need a very good instrument and a skilled operator and a lot of careful measurements to see the difference between them. But now, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is look at the difference between their emission wavelengths and you can tell one from the other. So this is a great analytical tool for qualitatively distinguishing and identifying the nanotubes in your sample. And it means that if you have a mixed sample and you want to investigate some chemical reaction that varies in its rate, for example, with structure, you can see that as a ch through the changes in the spectroscopy. You can basically, structure with structure selectivity, monitor these processes for a whole range of structures through, through the spectroscopic measurements. And uh, let me just tell you very briefly about an application that we've been working on all this time in, in my laboratory, which is that analytical application. And we're trying to make it more efficient as well. So one thing we did was kind of design and build an optimized apparatus for uh, analyzing these liquid dispersions of carbon nanotubes. And the idea is that this is our cell cubed with nanotubes. We excite it with a few discrete laser wavelengths. And in each case, we uh, capture very quickly the emission spectrum in a multi-channel spectrometer. And each one of these spectra can be it can run actually a little faster than this animation, so within seconds we get a set of four or five spectra. We can also run a Raman spectrum on this without moving the sample, and we can let a, a white light source through the sample and measure the attenuation as a function of wavelength to get an absorption spectrum ranging through the visible and near infrared. So these are three powerful spectroscopic characterization tools for carbon nanotubes, and uh, these can all can be combined into a single quick instrument. Uh, the result of that is an interpretation 
a semi-automated structural interpretation of the spectrum, which can reveal to you the magnitude diameter distribution. Because if you know what NMs you've got, you know the diameter of each one, and you can calculate from that, those abundances the diameter distribution. This is, again, information that you can get in a few minutes you now with a desktop instrument instead of a half a day of effort on a multi-million dollar TEM with very tedious process. Uh, fluorescence is, as any analytical chemist knows, is a very sensitive probe as well. So fluorescence is suitable for detecting nanotubes at trace concentrations down to a part in 10 to the 10th or so. You may say, well, if that's all the nanotubes I have, I'm going to go back and make my sample more concentrated. But there are people working in environmental studies and biomedical studies who have only tr specimens with trace nanotubes to detect. And this is a premier technique for, de for detecting and studying them in those circumstances. Now, it's also possible to use fluorescence or photoluminescence to study the physical properties of nanotubes. So in, in our lab, we've developed a, uh, we've basically adapted a commercial microscope for this application. We've <coughs> set up excitation lasers, basically just red lasers, like a more powerful version of the one I'm holding. To excite the specimen, we capture the emitted light coming down, and we put it onto an indium gallium arsenide camera. Uh, these cameras are terrible because they cost a fortune, and they don't have very many pixels, and they've got lots of defects. So why do we use them? They work at these wavelengths. Unfortunately, we can't use the nice cameras. We have to use these crappy cameras. But they do capture the near-infrared emission and let us see the nanotubes. And then we can also flip a mirror, and we can look at the emission from one position in the sample and take its spectrum. So here's an example of how beautiful the spectra are from individual nanotubes. This is not one type of nanotube. This is one single nanotube under the microscope. And each, each one of these spectra is taken from, the, obviously, a different nanotube. And they're normalized here to let you compare. But you can see, uh, we know exactly which nanotubes they are from the spectral emission wavelengths. And they have these beautifully sharp transitions. Uh, people interested, you know, interested in quantum dots and gold nanoshells and other such nanoparticles, none of them have such beautifully distinct and sharp uh, emission features. Uh, these are only maybe 10 or 20 nanometers wide. It's 1 or 2 percent of the central wavelength. So that lets you easily distinguish the spectral features of different nanotubes as well. Uh, we can image them at video rates. So this is one nanotube under the microscope in liquid undergoing thermal motion. This is not a worm. This is not a living object. It's a nanotube. And it is undergoing Brownian motion and Brownian bending. So it's translating and rotating and bending just under thermal forces. Now this nanotube is much, it, it's actually about 10 microns long, but it's, uh, let's just go back because it's pretty, we can start again. Here we go. Um, It's much skinnier than it looks because this is an optical measurement. We are limited by the diffraction, optical diffraction. So this looks like it's a micron wide. It's actually a nanometer wide. So imagine that this is a thousand times skinnier than it looks here. That's the realistic situation. And even though these are rigid, something this long can still undergo thermally induced bending. And in fact, from the magnitudes of those bends, we can deduce the mechanical rigidity. And we've done that as a function of diameter. All right, thank you. You're kind of <laughs> okay, so here's a. Uh, uh, this is an assembly of nanotubes, not just one, undergoing Brownian motion. These are shorter, so we see them as spots. It's kind of like astronomy, except that things are really moving. You can see that they're wandering around. Well, again, this is Brownian motion in a kind of a viscous, aqueous based medium. And we can uh, look at the same thing and now track. Uh, in software, the trajectories of each nanotube. So now the trajectories are showing up as colored <coughs> traces uh, for each one of them. And as we do this for a while, we can see diffusional trajectories for um, a lot of nanotubes in parallel. Each trajectory is characteristic of the diffusion coefficient of that nanotube, which in turn is characteristic of its length. So even though we can't measure the length from the image, we can deduce the length from the diffusion coefficient that it has moving around this 
So this provides us with a way to measure length distributions of nanotubes using an optical technique. We call this length analysis by nanotube diffusion, LAND. And in fact, we have uh, developed and uh, validated this method. This is the standard method of atomic force microscopy to determine your distributions. And the diffusion method is, uh, is in good agreement with it and has some advantages in terms of the ability to give you better statistics in a short period of time. So we, we use this as a working tool all the time in my laboratory. Uh, you can use this spectroscopy to study extrinsic effects, things that, uh, perturbations on the nanotube. And one thing that happens is that chemical perturbations can quench the nanotube fluorescence. So here we, I'm going to illustrate to you the baseline behavior of nanotubes. This, nan this is an image of a nanotube. It's a shorter one, so it looks all pixelated. Here's its uh, fluorescence intensity as a function of excitation intensity. And you say, well, that's not interesting. You said linear. Isn't that what you'd expect? It's good that it's linear. This means we're in a very kind of a safe, simple regime. Uh, and what about the time dependence? Well, the time dependence is extremely boring. This is the actual spectrum of the emission. And here's the spectrum taken over and over and over again for five minutes. And basically nothing happens. Uh, and you say, is that interesting? It is if you've ever worked with, with uh, quantum dots or with uh, organic fluorophores, because what you would see in an experiment like that is a wandering of the emission wavelength or a blinking on and off or just a general loss of emission as it, as it got dark through photo bleaching. So the lesson of this image is that the nanotubes are really robust. They are very stable fluorophores. And in fact, I think they're the most stable fluorophores that, that we know about. So against this baseline, let's take a look and see what perturbs that stability. Uh, this is the baseline again, baseline behavior, where this is the background signal, this is the fluorescence or emission from one nanotube in solution at pH 7. And 10,000 consecutive measurements show no significant change. So that's boring, right? That's good. Well, what happens if we, uh, but, but every now and then, every now and then, there's something that looks like a real glitch. It goes down for a while and then comes back. That turns out to be uh, effective, a chemical reaction on the surface of the nanotube. And we're looking at one nanotube now. So this is a single molecular event that has perturbed the fluorescence for a time, and then it has reversed. So that's a reversible termination event. We can study this in more detail by setting up our apparatus to deliberately inject a reagent into a uh, immobilized nanotube sample and observe its fluorescence as a function of time. When we do that, and we use a particular <coughs> reagent <coughs> me, that is known to quench the fluorescence through chemical reaction, we find that the fluorescence goes down. But look at the way it goes down. You think, well, it should just be a nice exponential decay. But we're talking about a single particle now. And the decay is quantized. It comes in steps. This is like a single reaction. It's probably a double step like that, another single and a single. What's happening now is that we are looking at a diffraction-limited segment of the nanotube and observing single molecule reactions revealed as a change in intensity. So by measuring the magnitude of this step compared to the initial value, we deduce what fraction of the nanotube has been darkened or quenched by this reaction. And from that, we can deduce the mobility of these electronic excitations along the nanotube. Because it turns out that when you excite a nanotube, you make what's called an exciton. And that's a, 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 the excited electron columbically coupled with its the hole that it left behind in the valence band. And these things are a little hydrogenic-like uh, bosley mark molecule that that excitation has mobility and it can diffusively move up and down the nanotube. And as it does that, uh, it can encounter a site of quenching because of chemical defect. And if it, if it runs into one of those defects, the emission goes away. So these steps reveal to us how mobile those excitons are. And this is a little illustration of how. Yes. So as we get more and more defects, uh, we see more and more steps, more and more darkened regions, you see. And we eventually have a bunch of steps 
that lead to the overall marketing of the manager. And as we make these measurements and deduce the excursion range, that is the mobility range of the exciton, uh, we find evidence that uh, it goes as the square root of the intensity, and that tells us that this really is a diffusional process where the diffusion, uh, diffusional excursion uh, parameter uh, is going as the one half power of the intensity. So it confirms that physical notion that I just told you about. And it also tells us that these nanotubes, these excitons, can visit up to 20,000 carbon atoms during their lifetime. They are world travelers. They got a lot of frequent flyer miles. And make an exciton, and it's going all over the place. So if you have even a very small defect density on the surface of the nanotube of a, of a sort that will quench the emission, uh, it's quite likely that the nanotube, the exciton, will be able to find that. So they have a big range, up to 200 nanometers, as you can see from this. Um, so now I just want to switch gears, since time is running down, uh, and tell you about something else that is in the applications world instead of in the basic science world. And this is to apply nanotubes as strain sensors. So we call this strain sensing smart skin. And we give it this clever name, S to the fourth power. So you know, your institute has only a second power in its title, but we are now up to the fourth power in our abbreviation. OK, so what is this idea about measuring strains? Well, um, it turns out that there are a lot of industrial applications where you want to measure strain, which is a deformation of some material. Because uh, people who work with aircraft uh, fuselages, airframes, or pipelines that carry dangerous materials, or pressure vessels in chemical plants that hold dangerous materials, you have to be very careful, or bridge supports, or structural supports in buildings. They have to make sure that there's no mechanical failure of those structures. And this is a whole field called structural health maintenance, which means people have, have to assure that uh, it's in good shape. And this is obviously important for protection of life and property. Uh, one thing you look for as an early symptom of failure is a deformation of the metal. Uh, an aircraft uh, fuselage can be subjected to large forces in, in flight, and those can permanently bend or deform some of, the, some of the structures. So that is a weakening process that precedes failure. So you want to measure strain in many industrial applications. Uh, and just, just like I said here. So it turns out the technologies for doing this are amazingly bad. Most of them are quite old and they have disadvantages. And our approach is to develop a new technology that overcomes these disadvantages and uses nanotubes as the sensors. How can that be? Well, the idea is the nanotube is put into a plastic film, like a, like a coating, like a varnish. In fact, we started out with something we bought at a uh, home improvement store where you would go to buy stuff for your house. You bought a varnish that you would paint onto something, and we put nanotubes into it, dispersed nanotubes. And then, when there's strain, we can see spectral shifts in the emission. Let me show you how that works. The, the basic spectroscopy that I've been telling you about is altered by mechanical stretching or compression of the nanotube. When you do that, you change the positions of the carbon atoms in very systematic ways, and you change the electronic structure. You change the band gap of the semiconductor nanotubes. And you can see this uh, very easily in the laboratory, if you make measurements of those uh, spectra. And we did this almost 10 years ago, looking at individual nanotubes under the microscope. And now what we were trying to do, uh, yeah, OK, so, so the, the theory that goes with that and the experiments that we and other people did shows that these shifts are linear with strain. They're opposite for the mod 1 and the mod 2, these two subfamilies, the red and the blue nanotubes. They depend on the roll-up angle, and they also obviously depend on the projection strain along the nanotube axis. So the way this works, here's the basic spectral map of the nanotubes. And if you now stretch the nanotubes, they move in these directions. So the, the mod 2 nanotubes move toward the center line that separates the mod 1 and the mod 2. This is the boundary between them. And the blue ones move in diagonal direction, also towards the line. So we know from theory and from experiment, these are very systematic, fundamental shifts in the spectrum that occur because of the atomic displacements that result from stretching or compression. 
So here's the basic idea. We take nanotubes, which are actually smaller than this in reality, and we put them into this film and paint it onto a substrate. So this film is only 10 microns thick or so. So it's just a, a little, a little thin, thin layer. And now, if the substrate is stretched by a strain process, it carries the film along with it because it's sticky. And then the nanotubes are stretched by the film that they're embedded in. And we pick up that change in nanotube dimension without touching it, just by shining a laser to excite the fluorescence and then looking at it in a spectrometer. And this is, this is the basic idea. Obviously, we're not looking at a single nanotube. We're looking at ensembles. But this is the concept. And uh, if, you, if this works, then you don't have to touch the, the substrate to make the measurement. And you don't have to uh, uh, worry about where you're exciting, where you're looking, because nanotubes are everywhere. Yes, come on. So here's what it looks like under the microscope. Uh, we have a film painted onto a metal substrate. This is an aluminum substrate. And each one of these bright things is one of these isolated nanotubes, randomly oriented and positioned within the film. So if we look kind of anywhere with a spot about this size, we're going to take up the emission from many nanotubes. And in order to do this experiment, we realized, or, or this technology, we realized early on we could do the experiments in my laboratory on a big optical table. But if we had to uh, measure strain in an, air, in an aircraft wing, Probably that aircraft wasn't going to come into my lab. We would have to have an apparatus that went to the, went to the uh, sample. So we made effort to miniaturize and make this more portable. And here's one of the, we're actually two generations beyond this now. But you see this is only uh, like about 100 millimeters by 150 millimeters. And it's a very compact system with an excitation laser and uh, and the optics necessary to excite the sample and to pick up the emission and even control the polarization under computer control. So we have made this quite small. And here's the kind of data that we can get on one of those films. Uh, in two seconds, uh, we get a spectrum that shows the emission from two of these particular nanotubes, 7.5 and 7.6. And we get high quality data. We can determine these peak positions with high precision. And now if we induce strain, uh, we can see these small but, but very systematic shifts in the peak positions that we can pick up and deduce because we have high quality spectra, even though we only spend a couple seconds measuring each one. And notice that 7.5 and 7.6 move in opposite directions. That's because they are opposite mod families. One's a red and one's a blue. So here is an example of how the spectral response varies with the substrate strain. This is measured from a conventional gauge. And we see a very nice linear high precision uh, correlation between them. We can in, uh, do cyclic, uh, cyclic variation of the strain in the system and see the corresponding cyclic uh, spectral responses that match very well. And we can even pick up the angle of the strain because uh, if, uh, the transitions that we're working with are strongly polarized along the nanotube axis. If we change the polarization of the light, we interrogate a different subset of nanotubes pointing in a different direction. So we can ask them, what's the strain along this direction? What's the strain along this direction? And see the strong angle dependence here. So we can deduce the uh, angle of maximum strain to within a few degrees uh, in a pretty simple measurement as well. So this is the kind of conceptual cartoon that I drew very near the beginning of this process, where we would have the, the thing we're monitoring with the coating on it. And in order to see the whole strain map, what we would do is measure with a portable instrument, point by point, and we would do some kind of raster scan along the surface, picking up measurements all the way along until we got all the, all the information we needed. So I had this, this animation you know, for some years before we could actually realize that idea. But now we do have a scannable uh, read head, and we can pick up the data fast enough to really implement this. And I just wanted to show you what I consider a very beautiful strain map that we measured. This is 1,600 independent measurements, each one made from the spectra. And uh, we just uh, covered this uh, 40 by 40 millimeter region of a copper plate that had been mechanically stressed after it had a hole drilled in it. And the hole uh, generates a particular kind of stress pattern that leads to a particular strain result. And we're picking up that particular very characteristic pattern with these strain measurements here as a function of position. 
So this is an actual two-dimensional strain map measured with this technology that I've been explaining to you. So we think that this has a real chance to become a useful thing in the real world. And that would be great because all science depends on the, uh, eventually, the scientific research we do is justified by society because it turns into something useful. And for nanocarbons, what we need is some really important useful applications so that, so that the applications will thrive and also support the basic science that underlies them. So at that point, I'd like to stop uh, and summarize. Take home lesson. Nanotubes emit sharp and robust band gap photoluminescence in the short wave infrared. And you can do all sorts of things with this. You can identify structures, analyze your mixtures, watch individual nanotubes move around, monitor chemical reactions, study exciton dynamics, and measure strains, and the list extends beyond this. I want to thank my coworkers. Uh, these are the main people who have contributed to the projects I've shown you. My long-term coworkers, Sergei Bachilo, the brilliant scientist who actually discovered nanotube fluorescence in 2001, and uh, former students, Dima Sobolski and John David Rocha, and Tanya Cherokuri, and Jason Streit, uh, coworkers on the STRAIN project. This particularly said my colleague at Rice and engineering professor, Satish Nagaraja, and uh, some uh, visitors in the Hukar lab, a graduate student, Annie Sitton, and a sabbatical visitor, Lamont Kanye. So the folks who gave us the money are NSF, the Welsh Foundation, and Naval Research. My dean tells me I have to uh, put up this disclosure because we have a company that makes men to analyzers. So uh, I have a conflict of interest there. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention.